I'm excited about what we're going to study as we come to the fourth part of what's next on God's calendar. And I say that because as we look at the topics that we covered so far, we've talked about the, the rapture, the tribulation, the battle of Armageddon. Today we're going to do the millennial kingdom. And really, each time we've asked, what's the purpose and when will it take place? Because if we know the purpose that God has for each of these five events, and we know when they take place, I think we really begin to understand that God has a, a wonderful, marvelous plan. And then I want to say thank you because while I know about the Millennial Kingdom, I don't know that I've ever spent a week or two studying just the Millennial Kingdom. And I've been able to do that because I was so excited to, that we were going to be covering this as our fourth event. And so, wow, the things that God has in store for us, I'll just tell you this, I'm really excited. And I hope by the time we finish our study of the Millennial Kingdom that you will be excited as well about what God has planned for us. Well, let's look at it in this way. What does the word millennial mean? Because I know from time to time it's talked around and, and used in a variety of ways, but in a biblical sense, it really the Latin word mill means a thousand. And then annum, it's where we get the word annual, and it means year. So together, it means a thousand years. And a lot of times people say, well, can you take it literally? And I believe that you can, and here's why. Because when you go to Revelation chapter 20, verses 2 through 7, and we're going to read those verses later, but, but not right now. It's interesting because no less than six times it says that the rule of the millennial kingdom will last a thousand years. Now relax. The plan of God is much bigger than a thousand years. Matter of fact, it's eternal. And so the millennium is the stepping stone into the eternal kingdom of God. But when you see all that's going to take place in this thousand year period, you're going to really be excited. The other thing that I think is important for us to notice is that in Isaiah chapter 65, it says that the earth is renewed and the curse is reversed. Can you imagine the curse of the earth reversed? Wow. You know, you go back to the Garden of Eden in your mind and you think, what was it like? The creation was beautiful. The, the, the soil gave uh, fruit and, and vegetables and crops abundantly. The trees grew incredibly big and, and beautiful. The, the environment, the atmosphere was perfect. And so this is going to be an exciting time because the earth is going to be renewed. We'll see some verses in the New Testament that talk about what takes place. Matter of fact, it says creation groans waiting for it to be renewed. And for that curse to be reversed, what an exciting time. And so those are some of the things that really got me excited as I began to study about the Millennial Kingdom. Now, first of all, let's ask what's the purpose of the Millennium? Remember, event by event, we talked about the purpose, we talked about the time frame. And so all the way over at number four, you'll see the beginning of the Millennial Kingdom. And really, this kingdom is multi-purpose. And so let's just take a moment to look at some purposes I know for some of those we just had one or two purposes, but for this one we have five. And what's interesting about this is, first of all, it's going to show how Jesus Christ will rule over Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. You see, up until now, it looks like Satan has the upper hand. But I want you to know that by the time we get to the Millennial Kingdom, God shows that Jesus has the upper hand. Next, it's going to fulfill God's promises to Israel, all the way back to, to the days of Abraham. In the book of Genesis, God made promises to Israel, and those, many of those, are going to be fulfilled in the millennial kingdom. I think it's also neat because God will fulfill His promise to the church. He made some specific promises. We're going to try to sort those out. And again, if you know Christ and you see the promises that He's made, wow, you're going to be as excited about the millennial kingdom as I am. And then the fourth one says this, that, that God will show that every individual must still respond to the God's offer of salvation. The environment will be perfect. It will be a, a just society, socially and, and uh, governmentally, it'll be just. But still, an individual must come to Christ as their Savior. And then I think the last thing, God is going to show how the earth can function once the curse is removed. Again, I think when you begin to look at that, you're going to be so excited. Well, that's the purpose. Remember I told you it's multi-purpose. It's not like some of the other ones that we've looked at, like the tribulation really just had one thing in mind. But when you come to this, it's a multi-purpose that God has. It's a thousand year period. And believe me, as we go through that thousand years, every day we're gonna see how great God is. And then I can hardly wait to see the next phase of what he has in mind for the people of God. 
Well, when does it occur? What an important question. And so here's what I'm going to tell you. It occurs shortly after Armageddon. Remember we studied that last week, the Battle of Armageddon. And a period of 75 days follows. Now, how do we say that 75 days? Well, in Daniel chapter 12, the last book of Daniel, God explains it. And here's what he does. He talks about from the midpoint of the tribulation to the end of the, the tribulation time, he said it's going to be 1,260 days. So when you take 1,260 days, divide it by 30 days per month, you end up with 42 months or three and a half years. And then it says this in the last two verses of Daniel, it talks about how that blessed are those who go not just to 1,260 days, but he says blessed are those who go to 1,290 days and then to 1,335 days. In other words, 75 extra days. I'm going to be honest with you. I've never seen a great description of what takes place in that 75 days. I think the scripture is quite on it. But let me give you an idea to think about. I think that after Armageddon, after the tribulation, the earth is going to be such a mess that it's going to take 75 days to clean it up. And then God begins saying, okay, here's the millennium. I'm going to show you what happens when the curse is reversed and when the right king is ruling. So what an exciting time. So that's how come I say it'll be Armageddon and then 75 days. Now, I want to read to you this wonderful portion of Scripture, Revelation chapter 19, because here's what it says, and I think you'll be able to see how this transitions to the millennial kingdom. I think in Revelation chapter 19, and if, actually if I get, begin back at verse 9, it says, now it's the marriage supper of the Lamb. So in heaven we finish the judgment seat of Christ. We finish the marriage supper of the Lamb. And now we come back with Christ to the earth. I think this is called the revelation of Christ. Remember we had that on our diagram and we'll see it again in a minute. Here's what it says in verse 11. I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. And he that sat on was called faithful and true and in righteousness doth he judge and make war. Now who is faithful and true but Jesus? Then it says, verse 12, His eyes were like the flame of fire. On his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. Just several things there. First of all, remember when Jesus was here on the earth the first time, he wept. Wept over his friend Lazarus. He, he wore a crown. The only crown he wore was the crown of thorns. But when he comes this time, he will wear many crowns. Different word. He had a name written that no man knew. I really believe that's talking about his glory, his, his characteristics. And it says that no man has ever seen all the glory, all the characteristics of God we're going to. Verse 13, he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, not his blood, but the blood of his victims. And his name is called the Word of God. Now, for sure, this has got to be Jesus. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so here he will be known as the Word of God. Verse 14, the armies that were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed with fine linen, white and clean. So now the believers, the saints, the bride of Christ that have been in heaven celebrating for the seven plus years, we come back with him to the earth. Verse 15, out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, and that with it he should smite the nations. He shall rule them, that's the action of a king, with a rod of iron. He treads on winepress of fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, and on his vesture and on his thighs a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so we see how great God is in this whole passage as he comes back down. Verses 17, 18 and 19, it talks about that when he comes down, he will be there in Megiddo Valley. And as the victims are, are slain, remember we, we saw the blood would be to the bridle of a horse, as the victims are slain, they invite the birds to come and to feed on that. It's interesting because in Israel, one of the remarkable things is that's where the main landing strip is. I showed you a picture of it last week. And several times a year, they can't even fly airplanes in and out of that airport because there's so many buzzards and vultures that come up and down the valley as they migrate to, to Europe and Asia, down to Africa several times a year. And God's going to say, I'm going to invite them to come. The birds are going to come, and they're going to feed on the flesh of kings and captains, the ones that oppose God. And then it says, I saw the beast and the kings of the earth, 
and their armies gathered together to make war against Jesus that sat on his horse and his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, which deceived people and caused them to receive the mark of the beast. And when they finished this, it says, they, these both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. That's the, the end of the, that tribulation. And so that's when it's going to take place. God has a, a marvelous plan, doesn't he? Now, as we look at this, as we talk about its beginning, again, I want you to see that, that see the kingdom of God? It goes immediately after Christ's return, the revelation of Christ, and shortly after the Battle of Armageddon. As he comes, he will reveal himself. You see, the Battle of Armageddon, he reveals himself for the great king that he is, the great warrior that he is. And it begins with him judging the nations that come against Israel. Matter of fact, in Revelation chapter 16, just a chapter before, it's interesting because here's what it says. It says, these are spirits of demons that work miracles. They go forth unto the kings of the earth, to the whole world, to gather them to the battle and that great day of God Almighty. And then it goes on to say, and he gathers them together in a place called in the Hebrew term Armageddon. So you see, he first does battle with the nations that were coming against Israel. Next, he's going to have a, a judgment of the nations. This is described in, in Matthew chapter 25. Again, I, I want to go to this because I think sometimes people don't realize how precise God is in his word. But when you go to Matthew chapter 25, he mentions the fact, that, let me try to connect you together, 25 verse 31, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. So when he comes at this revelation, he's going to sit on the throne of his glory, that's Armageddon, and he defeats those armies that came against Israel in the, in the battle of uh, Armageddon, in the valley of Megiddo. And then it says that he's going to, before him he's going to have, gather all the nations. He will separate them one from another as the shepherd divides sheep from the goats. He shall set the sheep on the right side, the goats on the left side. And then he's going to say to those that are the sheep nations that they are to go with him into the millennial kingdom. And the goats on his left, it says when he judges them, what's interesting is this, the sheep nations will go into the kingdom and the goat nations will be cast into the lake of fire where the, where the beast and the false prophet are. It calls this the throne of his glory at Jerusalem. And so this is how the millennium begins. Wow, God has such an incredible plan. And I, you know, when I look at this, I relax if you're worried about what's taking place today because I know this, that God has a, a marvelous plan. Now, the other thing that he does as we begin this millennial kingdom is the judgment of the false trinity. And for that, let's go back now to Revelation chapter 19. Notice that we, we're trying to document this with Scripture because there's lots of opinions and our opinion doesn't matter. What really matters is, is what the Word of God says. Revelation 19, remember that's when he came back uh, on the white horse out of heaven. That's when he took the, the, the beast and the false prophet and cast him into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. And so it says this, that the beast is taken and the false prophet that wrought miracles and those which deceive them to receive the mark of the beast and them that worship his image, these both are cast alive into the, to the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. So that's going to be part one of that judgment. Then chapter 20, the very next section, it says this, I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the keys of the bottomless pit. So there's two items here. There's the lake of fire and there's a bottomless pit. I think of the bottomless pit as kind of a holding tank. It's like the county jail, whereas the lake of fire burning forever and ever with brimstone. That's like the, the penitentiary. The, you go there and you're, you're there forever. And so it says he comes down. He has the keys of the bottomless pit. He lays hold on the dragon, the old serpent who's called the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. So that's where I think we are right now in our, in our little uh, lesson of how it begins. He will cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. After that, he must be loosed a little season. So for a thousand years, the devil is going to be in this bottomless pit. One more thing that we want to look at. 
Let's go to Revelation chapter 20 and verse 10. And we're a little bit out of order, but as we do so, I've just jumped a thousand years. And here's what the Bible clearly states. And the devil that deceives them was cast into the lake of fire and, and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So, at the beginning of the tribulation, the beast and the false prophet are put into the lake of fire. Then, the devil is bound for a thousand years. Why is that important? You're going to see it in just a minute. Can you imagine this earth operating without the influence of the devil and, and the devil's partners? And then all three eventually end up in the lake of fire. My friend, a person who has never received Christ, they'll spend eternity with that false trinity, the beast, the false prophet, and the devil himself. I don't know about you, but that's good enough reason for me not to want to go there. The opposite is to be saved, to know Jesus Christ. And if so, guess what? We get to rule and reign with him on the earth for a thousand years, and our permanent home will be heaven itself. Well, here's another aspect of it that I think is important to look at. And again, I want us to go to this passage in, in Luke chapter 1. And as we go to Luke chapter 1, you might say, well, that's the Christmas story. And it is. In other words, God in His Word links together the first coming of Christ to the earth and the second coming of Christ to the earth it, called the Revelation. Remember, the rapture, we meet Him in the air. So there's really two comings to the earth. One is His incarnation and one when He comes to rule as a king. The first time He came as a baby. Huh. The next time He comes as a king. But notice what it says in Luke chapter 1, verses 31 and 33. It says, talking to Mary, it says that the angel said unto her, to her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, shall bring forth a son, shall call his name Jesus. Now listen to this. And he shall be great, and he shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. This is the stone that, that Daniel saw in the image that, of Nebuchadnezzar, where the stone came and crushed all the, the man-made governmental systems. And that stone grew and, and, and lasted forever. And so, now, let's look at the tribulation. Here's the millennium that we're studying right now. And what's the event that takes place in the middle? Well, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. When He comes and He puts His feet on the Mount of Olives, Zechariah chapter 14, verse 4. It says that when He does that, He splits the mountain in two. Splits it so bad that I think that the Mount of Olives is gone. And so the tribulation, this is the Antichrist kingdom. The millennium, it's Jesus Christ's kingdom. You see the contrast that's here. And, and from the very beginning, right from the, His birth, God promised that's what would take place. He would rule from the throne of His Father. I'm, I'm excited as, as we look at this. Next, it says that the tribulation, it's a counterfeit kingdom. Remember, everything the Antichrist did was to deceive, to, 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 to mislead people. When Jesus Christ comes, it will be a kingdom of truth. It will be a genuine kingdom. The contrast is incredible, isn't it? And then this one, Satan is defeated. The master, the king of that tribulation, he will be dethroned and defeated as we saw when Christ comes back at the battle of Armageddon. He'll be bound and thrown into the bottomless pit for a thousand years. But Jesus Christ, he will restore Israel according to Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 13. So what a contrast we have. As we begin to look at this tribulation, and now you see why I'm so excited about it. There's so many exciting things that, that God has planned for us. And so a man by the name of Clarence Larkin wrote something called Dispensational Truth. Let me tell you, that book is over 100 years old. It's out of print. But I had a copy, and I, and I just obtained another copy, and have I enjoyed it. And Mr. Larkin divided this history of mankind into three regions. It's interesting, I think, because before the cross, that's his first coming to the earth, and from the fall to the cross is one period. From the cross to when Christ comes back the second time, the revelation is the second period. And then we have the eternal kingdom. Now, notice what he said. He says that, that in each period there's a symbol that really helps represent the whole process. This one is the altar. Wow, I, I think this insight is, is remarkable from this, this man of God. And the altar, it looks back to the fall because when man fell, we needed a savior. We needed a redeemer. And so the altar looks back to the fall. 
but it looks forward to the cross because you see, when Christ died on the cross, he fulfilled all the Old Testament sacrifices. And so the altar is a symbol that shows this first one. The next one, from the cross to the revelation, he says the symbol is the table, breaking the bread, remembering the Lord. I go to a, a fellowship of believers and you know what? We break bread every week. It's so important, here's why. Because at the table, we look back to the cross and then we look forward to the coming of Christ. Matter of fact, here's a scripture that you've probably read many times. And now maybe you understand it even better. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. 26, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show forth the Lord's death until he come. His death until he comes. And so how important that is. And that's why every week I enjoy meeting with other believers and we, we go to the table where the bread is there, a picture of his body broken. The cup is there, a picture of his blood shed. We remember the cross, thank God for the cross, but we remember the fact that he's coming again. And so that's why the scripture says, you do show forth the Lord's death until he comes. And then the third region, from the revelation to the eternal kingdom, well, Mr. Larkin says, it's a throne. The throne looks back to the revelation when he comes because he came back to rule and to reign, to, to defeat Satan, and looks forward to the eternal kingdom because he will reign forever. Matter of fact, he even takes those three regions and he says, one of them represents prophetically Christ. One of them represents Christ priestly, and the last one represents him kingly. Remember, Jesus was prophet and priest and king. And I think that's a, a wonderful way to enjoy this whole study of the millennial. Well, I've enjoyed looking at that. I hope you will. Matter of fact, I, I hope you'll spend some time to, to just study that, that view graph that we've seen. Now, the overview of the millennium is found in the book of Ezekiel. And, and I say that because to me it's interesting that really Ezekiel in 572 BC, we know the date very well because historically we know what was taking place based on scripture. So it was the 25th year of the captivity, 14 years after the destruction of the temple. And what takes place is that God gives Ezekiel a vision, not a dream, but a vision. And in the vision, he goes back to Jerusalem and he sees the glory of God. It's interesting because the book of Ezekiel ends with Jesus and it says this, that Jehovah Shammah, or Jehovah is present. That's how the book of Ezekiel ends. But I think the book of Ezekiel is really an important one in our study, and here's why. You see, as we begin to study this millennium, in the book of Ezekiel, I want you to see how orderly the chapters are. Now, I'm gonna be honest with you. In my study of the millennium, I've had to look at Isaiah, Ezekiel, Zechariah, Joel, Revelation, Daniel, and the Gospels. I don't know of any study in the Bible that, that brings you to more scriptures and more promises that God has made. Oh yeah, he made promises in Genesis and, and in the, in the other portions there are promises made to the church. But these are major portions of the, each of these books that deal with this millennial kingdom. And so let's look at it this way in our preview. First, Chapter 36, Israel's regathered in the land. Remember, we've read that, we've studied that in some of our previous programs. And we saw that Israel would come back to the land. God would bring them back to the land, even though they were scattered. And the land was going to begin to produce crops, as we find in, in uh, chapter 37. It says that Israel would become a nation, and they would become a great army. And they'd no more be two kingdoms, not a, a Judah and Israel. They'd be united as one when they came back. It was fulfilled. These predictions made 2,500 years ago, 2,500 years ago, we are the ones that are watching Israel come back to the land. We're the ones that are watching crops. We're the ones that have seen Israel become a great nation. We're the ones that are watching this great fulfillment. Chapter 38 and 39, God says that before he comes for his kingdom, Israel is going to be invaded by Russia, Iran, Ethiopia, Libya, Germany, and Turkey. These are the very nations that are right on the, on the northern border of Israel today in the Golan Heights, right on the border of Israel and Syria. We're, folks, we are, we are the generation that gets to see this. You know what it says? The kingdom of God is coming. And before the kingdom of God comes, there'll be the battle of Armageddon. And before Armageddon, there's going to be the start of the tribulation. And before the tribulation ever begins, Jesus calls his church out. We should be excited about this. And then in chapters 40 through 48, Israel is promised the millennium. Now, 
Here's why I say that this is important. Because you see, there's a vision of the Millennial Temple in chapters 40 and 43 through 43. And the great thing about this is that there's no place ever in the history of Israel, in the history of the world, where this temple that's described in these chapters has ever been built. So I know it's yet future. And the Bible speaks of it being in the latter days. Next, in chapter 43 through 46, it's going to talk about how we worship in the millennium. It's going to talk about an altar and sacrifices. I mean, why do we need a sacrifice in the millennium? Well, I'm going to try to explain it. It's going to talk about the East Gate again. Chapters 47 and 48, it's going to talk about how to divide the land, and it's going to talk about a new river that's going to spring up out of the middle of the, the temple sanctuary. Well, I'm telling you all this as an overview because I want you to know God has a plan. He's patiently waiting to show the world how His kingdom will operate. And when you see how His kingdom operates, you, you'll, be, you'll be stunned. It is that spectacular. I think you'll just be stunned. Now, to study the millennium, I think there's six stages that I want to talk about. But today, for the sake of time, we're going to talk about the judgment of the nations. The Bible is clear in both Matthew and in Zechariah that those nations friendly to Israel will go into the millennial kingdom. That's why I pray for my government that they will stay friendly to Israel. Oh, I, I would love for them not to go into the destruction. Because you see the contrast of the sheep nations who were friendly to Israel, who supported Israel, even when Israel was on the bottom of the stack. They're not going to remain on the bottom. The kingdom of God is going to talk about it. Wait till you see the verse God has. But then there are the goat nations. And the goat nations, when he judges them in Matthew 25, 41, he says, depart from me. And he sends them to the lake of fire. Wow. How important it is for our governments to support Israel. Why? Because God made a distinction between Israel and the church. God said that this is my earthly people and be kind to them. And many people have not done so. And then it says this, that Israel is going to become the head of the nations. I want you to notice this verse. Deuteronomy chapter 28 says, And the Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail. You see, right now, Israel appears to be the, the, the tail. Everyone picks on Israel. They boycott Israel. The, the United Nations is always putting a sanction on Israel, always reprimanding Israel. God says, I'm going to turn that around. You're going to be the head, not the tail. And thou shalt be above only and shall not be beneath if thou hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day to observe and to do them. This will be the time when God does that. Here's another aspect of it that's pretty exciting. The church will reign with Christ. Now, in the epistles, Paul writes to Timothy, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. You see, with is an important word. It says that when Christ comes back in the rapture, so shall we ever be with the Lord. So if you want to find me in heaven, look for Jesus. I'm going to be as close as I can to Jesus. It says we're, we're going to reign with him. If we deny him, he'll also deny us. Here's another passage, Revelation 20, verses 4 through 6. It says, I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they shall live and reign with Christ a thousand years. Yeah, that's that millennial kingdom. But the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years are finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death had no power. But they shall be called the priest of God and of Christ and shall reign with him one thousand years. Pretty clear that, that those believers, the church is going to reign with Christ. You're going to love this one. Revelation 5.10 and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. This will be fulfilled in that millennial kingdom. You see what I'm saying? There's great promises to Israel. There's great promises to the church. Now, Satan is bound for a thousand years. We've looked at this. Can you imagine as he's cast into the bottomless pit, his friends, the false prophet and the beast, they've already been put into the lake of fire, but he has a thousand years. Afterwards, he's going to be loosed. And while he's loosed after the thousand years, some people are still going to respond. A perfect environment. It's not our environment. It's the heart of man that needs to be converted. And that proves it. And then Revelation 20, 7 through 10. After the thousand years, Satan will be released. He goes right back. He goes right back in the same business of trying to gather people and revolt against God. You'd think he would. You know what? I, I conclude this, that Satan's a slow learner. 
because he's right back in the same business again. Now, well, we're not done with the millennium. We're going to continue this next week. I hope you see that I'm pretty excited about it, but let's give a little summary. Contrast of the tribulation to the millennium. In the tribulation, there's chaos. In the millennium, there's going to be comfort and enjoyment. In the tribulation, there's going to be destruction and death. In the millennium, there's going to be life. We're going to talk about how long you live. We're going to talk about health that you have. We're going to talk about the animal kingdom and all that God has. It's incredible to see the plan of God in this millennial kingdom. And by the way, that's only a thousand years. Eternity is just beginning. That, that's like a day to God. And he's got greater things promised for us. The second one is Jesus Christ will be present. Ezekiel chapter 48, verse 35 ends with a statement. The Lord is here, or Jehovah Shammah. The Lord is present. The great thing about the millennial kingdom is this. Jesus Christ will rule himself over that, over the earth. You know what? Sometimes people complain about their government, and they have reason to. But when you see how Jesus rules, we'll be excited, and you'll see some of the blessings of it. And then there are some key passages. We need to examine these, and we'll do so in our, in our future lessons. But here's another thing I want to point out. Creation coming back as God intended it. You're going to see how wonderful it is. This, thousand, this is just a thousand years. He has more in store. Matter of fact, he's got a new heaven and a new earth. And we're going to talk about how that fits into God's plan. But as you look at these beginning things concerning the millennium, I want to ask you the question that I ask you every week. Are you ready? You see, I see how wonderful it is going to be in the millennial kingdom. How the earth is going to return to, to operate like God intended it before the fall of man, before sin came in. And I'm going to be honest with you, I want you to enjoy it with me. I plan to enjoy that thousand years. It's going to be a day in the, in the mind of God, but a thousand years, think about it, how incredible that is. How long people live, the health of people, how people will, will enjoy things. The Bible talks about that. We'll look at it next week. But the question is, are you going to enjoy it? You see, if you don't come to Christ now, you're going to miss that. You're going to miss out on heaven. You're going to miss out on being the bride of Christ, the marriage supper of the Lamb. And you're going to miss out on the millennium as well. I, I hope you say, wow, I don't want to miss out on something that God has planned that's so beautiful, so wonderful. So how can you be a part of that? Well, you need to come to Christ as your personal Savior. I hope you realize that the Bible says we're all sinners. That's what we all have in common in heaven. Every person there will have admitted, I'm a sinner. In myself, I have no righteousness. In Christ, I have the righteousness that satisfies a heavenly Father. So number one, admit you're a sinner. Number two, accept the work that God has done for you. God did the work by sending Jesus to die on the cross. Jesus suffered and bled and died. Remember the table? Remember the picture there? It points back to the cross. Have you ever come back to the cross and said, I need my sins forgiven? And accept the broken body, accept the blood shed by Jesus as the payment for your sin. And then number three, personally accept him. It's not enough to say, yeah, he did those things. But you need to say, Jesus Christ, I take you as my Savior. I take you as my substitute. I accept you as my Savior, my Lord, and my King. And then guess what? You're ready. And now you'll enjoy all the blessings that God has. Father, we come to you today and we thank you for the Word of God. Father, we thank you that you're so specific in the events that are going to come upon this earth. And Father, while some are dreadful like the tribulation, we look at the millennium and we say, wow, what a plan God has. And Father, today, I, I don't want any one of our, our viewers to, to miss the plan of God, to miss the kingdom of God, to miss Jesus. Father, I pray today that you will exercise through the Spirit of God their hearts to come to Christ. And Father, for those that, that do know him, Father, may they have a hope May they see the great plan that God has, and today they'll embrace that plan as outlined for us in God's Word. Thank you for Jesus Christ. We pray these things in His precious name. Amen. All right. Uh, so that's part one of uh, the discussion about the millennium next week, or not quite next week. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But... Um, but uh, there's a second part to this where he dives into even more detail on some of the events of the millennium. I'm really looking forward to getting into that. I've seen both of the videos. I, I've watched all of these and uh, that are a part of this series. And, and like I said, this one, he just does a fantastic job talking about the millennium. 
There's one little quibble point, though, that I want to come back to for just a moment. And it's not that he and I disagree at all on this. It's just a term that he uses that, I, that to me is a little bit confusing. And that's when he talks about that during the millennium, the curse will be reversed. Now, he said it a couple of different times. I know what he's saying. And when you watch the second video, he clarifies and basically is going to say everything that I'm about to say right now. But the key, the thing that I quibble with is the use of that term reversed. Because, and I guess it would all kind of depend on how you want to use the word reversed, okay? If I'm driving down the road and I go into reverse, I'm going back to where I started, okay? Uh, back in the direction where I, you know, where I came from. If that's what he means by reversed, I'm okay with it. <laughs> but just most people, when they think of the term reversed, what they think of is that it's you know the complete opposite of. And that's where I quibble just a little bit, all right? And, and, and like I said, he, he actually says, like everything that I'm going to say in the next video, he basically says all of these things. But I just want to kind of clarify it because during the millennial kingdom, the curse of sin will be mitigated. It will be lessened, but it will not be what most people think of when they think of the word reversed, which is why I'm wanting to kind of touch on this for a second. Uh, the Bible makes it very, very clear, and, and he talked about this today, but the Bible makes it very clear in Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 and 2, that Satan will be bound during the tribulation or during the millennium. And, and I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. So the Bible is incredibly clear that at the beginning of the millennium, Satan is bound for a thousand years. He will not be able to influence uh, events. And, and, and it kind of makes sense that if Satan's going to be bound, the rest of the demons are too. Because what would be the point? <laughs> because the other demons would be just basically doing the same thing, even though it does not specifically say that here. But we know that Satan is going to be bound. He will not have the influence that he has. He will not be the prince of the power of the air uh, and, and all of those things, the roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. None of those things will be true during the tribulation. That's clear. We also know that during the tribulation, that, or excuse me, during the millennium, that predation, animal predation, being predators, uh, will also be reversed. It really will be reversed. It'll be ended. How do we know that? Well, if you go over to Isaiah chapter number 65 uh, and verse 25, it says very plainly, this is the one where you see in all the, this is the verse where you see all the pictures of the lion and the lamb next to each other and all of those kind of things. But this is what it says. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock. And dust shall be the serpent's meat. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, saith the Lord. There's another verse where it talks about children playing at the hole or at the nest of an asp, a, a, a very poisonous snake in that region. So we do know that during the millennium, that the animal predation will no longer be a thing. Everything will go back to eating uh, the plants of the field like you read in the book of Genesis. So I completely agree with that. And then we also know, again, staying here in Isaiah 65, we also know that long life, the kind of ages that it talks about before the flood, are going to be the norm during the millennium. Uh, Isaiah 65, starting in verse 20, uh, says this, there shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days, for the child shall die a hundred years old. In other words, if you die at a hundred, everybody's going to say, boy, he died young. Uh, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, that's basically what that says. Uh, but the sinner being a hundred years old shall be accursed. And they shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people, and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. In other words, you won't be building you know, your home and all this kind of stuff, and then your kids and your grandkids get to enjoy it. You're going to get to enjoy it. Um, but what that says is, if you read that passage carefully, is that life will be extended, but people are not living for... Now, 
the saints who've already gone to heaven and come back with Christ, we already have the eternal life. But these are the people who go in. These are the people who survive the tribulation, go into the millennium, who are a part of those sheep nations that he's talking about. It says that they'll live for hundreds and hundreds of years. But they will still die. And that's why I say the use of the word reverse is misleading. I, I know what he means, I think, <laughs> is that you're going backwards in the back toward the direction you came. But like I said, for most people, reverse means a complete change. So there will still be, uh, well, number one, people will still have those people who survive the tribulation, who enter the millennial kingdom, who have children during that thousand years, all of those children and all of those people who enter the millennium, even though Satan is no longer uh, uh, active in his role, people are still going to be people and they're still going to have the sin nature. Okay, That's why I say it's not reversed because people will still have the sin nature. The saints won't. We'll have already have our glorified bodies. We'll be ruling and reigning with him. We'll be perfect. These are the people who survive the tribulation on earth and who enter into the millennial kingdom as part of those sheep, uh, as those sheep nations. So they will still have the sin nature. They will have children who will still have the sin nature. And the Bible makes this clear a number of different ways. Um, in um, Revelation chapter 19, back where we were a moment ago, uh, in Revelation 19, 15, when it talks about Christ coming back at the battle of Armageddon, it says, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Why would he have to rule people with a rod of iron, which is talking about having to rule with a strong hand, unless people still had the sin nature that they had to contend with? As a matter of fact, Zechariah 14 tells us that people are still going to be difficult to deal with during the, tribula or during the millennium. Uh, Zechariah 14, verse 16. And it shall come to pass that every one that's left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So all of these nations, that people in these nations who survived uh, the uh, tribulation, who've entered into the millennial kingdom, part of their responsibility is to come yearly to Jerusalem to worship Christ personally at the Feast of Tabernacles, all right? And this is what it says, And it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not, they have no rain. There shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen uh, that cometh not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So if people didn't have the sin nature, they wouldn't be rebelling and not coming to the tabernacle or coming to the temple to worship during the Feast of Tabernacles. So they obviously still have the sin nature. Then lastly, in Revelation, but going back to Revelation 20, in verses 7 and 9, it says this, And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations, which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. If everybody was perfect, how would Satan convince multitudes of people for one more revolt? So we see that during the millennium that the sin nature still exists in every human being who's not already been, you know, uh, 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 um, raptured and, and have, they've got their new glorified body. These, again, are people, and I, I know I've said this a lot, but I want to make sure people understand. These are people who have survived the tribulation, who've survived the battle of Armageddon, who have survived the judgment of the nations. They're part of the sheep nations. They go into the kingdom. But that doesn't mean they don't have a sin nature. They'll live a lot longer. Things will be really wonderful. And yet at the end of that thousand years, Satan is going to be loosed and a bunch of them are going to turn right around and revolt again. So they still have the sin nature. So that's one reason that the sin, that the curse is not reversed. The other is, is the fact that death still exists. Like I said, to die at 100 years old would be considered to die as a child. 
So that says people are still dying, okay? Which tells us that this, what is the curse of sin? Death. So, yes, the curse has been very much mitigated. It's been very much, uh, uh, you know, um, weakened to where you're going back to an almost Edenic or right after, you know, right after the creation kind of life. Uh, but, the, but the curse of death is still there. People are still going to have the sin nature. So you can't really say that the curse of sin has been reversed. Like I said, unless he's using the term, and like I said, if you're going forward in a car and you go in reverse and you start backing up, you're returning to where you started. If he's using the term that way, I'm okay. <laughs> but that one, I just quibble a little bit right there on that. Now, next time. Uh, before we watch part two of the millennium uh, by Dr. Lindstedt, uh, I'm going to take a session and I'm going to talk about something that he mentions very, very briefly. He says the Bible is pretty much silent on what happens in that 75 days that Daniel talks about. He talks about there's 1,260 days. That's the midpoint of the tribulation to the end of the tribulation. Then there's 1,290 days, so another 30 days. And then 1335, which is another 45 days. And so, and, and at each of those intervals, at the end of the 30 days, it says good things are happening. At the end of the 45 days, it says good things are happening. Now, I think that the end of that 45th day, uh, or the total of 75, that's when the millennium starts. What happens during those two intervals, and why are they mentioned as two intervals of time? I think, I've, I think I have found in Scripture what probably may be the answer to those two questions. So the next time, uh, before we go into the next session with Dr. Lindstedt, I'm going to take a session and explain what, those 30, what, that third, what happens in that 30 and 45 days, at least as best I can tell from Scripture. Because Scripture says two major events happen. And uh, when you study it out, it makes a whole lot of sense that it's these two things. So... That's what we'll talk about. Then we'll jump right back into Dr. Linstead and let him finish up uh, his wonderful teaching there on the millennium. Any questions? Any questions? Cool. So don't forget, those of you that are watching via live stream, hang on. We'll be back on the private side here in just a moment. Got a quick order of business we need to take care of and one other thing I want to share with you, and then we'll be done for this evening, all right? God bless you. Thank you so much for joining us and being with us. Hope it was a blessing. All right, buddy.